Does the Falcons allowing defensive coordinator Ryan Nielsen to interview for other jobs mean a head coaching hire is imminent? No, it probably, in fact, means the opposite. You are Locked On Falcons, your daily Atlanta Falcons podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome back, everyone, to another illustrious episode of the Locked On Falcons podcast, your daily Atlanta Falcons podcast, part of Locked On Sports Atlanta, your team every day. And today's episode is brought to you by Prize Picks, the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Just go to prizepicks.com slash locked on NFL and use code in all lowercase locked on NFL for a first deposit match up to $100. And guys, if you don't know me, I'm your very, very humble host, Aaron Freeman. I've been covering the Falcons for far too long formerly at falcfans.com RIP. You may also know me as Sirius Black, Mr. Drew, Mr. AKA, and I appreciate each and every one of you that is an everydayer of this podcast that makes it your first watch or your first listen. Subscribe or follow for free on YouTube or wherever you listen to podcasts to get the latest episode as soon as it's available in YouTube can become an everyday. So by the end of today's episode, we're going to get insight into two more of the Falcons head coaching candidates, including Panthers defensive coordinator, Ajiro Evero and 49ers defensive coordinator, Steve Wilkes. But first let's talk about the Falcons very own defensive coordinator, Ryan Nielsen and the team backtracking on blocking him from interviewing for other jobs on Wednesday news broke that the Falcons are no longer blocking Ryan Nielsen from interviewing from the Jacksonville Jaguars vacant defensive coordinator spot after doing so last week. And we touched upon this a bit on the podcast, right? Nielsen uh, was one of three assistants last week that the Falcons blocked from interviewing for lateral moves. Offensive line coach Dwayne Ledford, special teams coordinator Marquise Williams were the other two. And teams are allowed to do that because they're lateral moves, right? And you can't block guys from a promotion. Like, for example, you couldn't block Ryan Nielsen for interviewing for a coach, a head coaching job, but you could block him from uh, interviewing for a defensive coordinator job. And we talked about, earlier over the weekend why the falcons might do this hoping to give whoever is their next head coach more options to choose from when they assemble their coaching staff but earlier we just we dis- talked about that despite the falcons blocking nielsen um the odds of him sticking around for that next coaching staff are fairly low and we put the ballpark figure at about 20 percent, and that was based off of past retention rates from the last three coaches that the Falcons hired going back to 2008 in terms of coaches that were on the previous coaches staff that were retained by the new head coach. Um, And, you know, with this news breaking that Nielsen is now going to be allowed to interview elsewhere, a lot of people are reading a lot into it, which I think is probably a mistake, right? Basically my response is, you know, this could mean anything. So therefore it kind of means nothing. Right. And people are wondering what has changed in the last five or six days since the Falcons were blocking these guys from interviews. And I've seen a lot of people trying to think, oh, well, they've interviewed a bunch of coaches in the last five or six days. So that means potentially, and most recently they interviewed Bill Belichick and Jim Harbaugh. And so that means a hiring is imminent. And now the Falcons realize that they're going to bring in one of these coaches. And so therefore they're letting these coaching staff go. And I just think this is people reaching, right? They're basically trying to connect two seemingly random events and thinking that they're related. Right. I think, in fact, it's more the opposite, that the Falcons are probably not going to hire a coach, you know, a coaching hire is imminent. And in fact, it may be another week or two before the Falcons hire a coach, perhaps even longer. And holding these assistant coaches hostage for that amount of time isn't in those assistant coaches best interest. Right. And we didn't talk about this the times when we talked about this on the podcast, but I kind of think blocking these coaches is kind of a jerk move. And the fact that the Falcons aren't blocking them anymore, despite the constant rhetoric of, you know, the fans means that the Falcons, you know, are kind of living up to their reputation as a well-run and classy organization. Um, but when we talk about connecting random data points, you, it, to me, I, I see it all the time on Twitter, right? Where people kind of overreact to the most recent data point. For example, last week on the day where the Falcons formally put in their interview request. It was the same day that the Patriots and Bill Belichick parted ways. And a lot of people were like, Hmm, these two things must be related. And no, it's just took the Falcons three days to get their ducks in a row. You know, Carolina and Washington were 
um, among the first teams to put in their interview requests because Carolina's been without a coach for six weeks, and so they've had a lot more time to get their ducks in a row. Washington, despite not firing Ron Rivera until after the season, it's been a you know open secret in Washington that Ron Rivera would not last this beyond the season for months. And so they've had plenty of time to work behind the scenes to get their ducks in a row. And you see other teams like Seattle and Las Vegas, right? That didn't start putting in their quest to this week. And, and Las Vegas has been without a coach for a long time. So, you know, talking about well-run organization, but that's a separate podcast. And so now people assume, Oh, you know, news, you know, a hiring must be intimate. And no, it's not. No, maybe I'm wrong. You know, again, wouldn't be the first time, be like the third time I've ever been wrong about a thing, but I'm so humble, right? And maybe I have to backtrack, you know, because tomorrow's episode is going to be the Falcons hired a new head coach. Maybe, but probably not. Because unlike so many other people that cover this team and follow this team, you know, my opinions aren't really based off of the most recent tweet that I've seen from the Falcons official account or Ian Rappaport or Adam Schefter or whoever, right? My opinions are often, not always, but often, backed by, you know, years and years of research and data, right? We got 15 years of data when it comes to Falcons coaching searches over 15 years, but you know, these particular opinions are based off of 15 years. And those 15 years are telling us that the Falcons are very thorough when it comes to these searching processes, consistently thorough. And the fact that the Falcons have yet to coach, uh, to, to speak with the coaches that coached this past weekend in playoff games, like Ben Johnson, Aaron Glenn, Bobby Slowick, Raheem Morris, means to me that they're not going to make a move with, until they talk to these guys, right? I can promise you that they're going to talk to these guys over the next couple of days, and then only after they talk to those guys, you know, all these virtual interviews that they're doing this week, then after that, there will be in-person interviews, which will probably begin at some point next week with, for some of these coaches, and then the week after for others. Only then, after all that happens, will we get a... Falcons finally going through that entire process and picking a coach. And that's not based off of a tweet, guys. Again, that's based off of 15 years of data, you know, of following these Falcons coaching searches. It's also based off of how the NFL has basically constructed the rules that teams are forced to obey by or else they lose draft picks. See the Arizona Cardinals last year to, that have basically slowed down the process. And, and we talked about this last year uh, with Jarvis Davis. Uh, on an episode talking about the Falcons DC search and why it took so long for the first coach to get hired, which was Frank Reich in last year's cycle, which was January 26. And that's due probably again, maybe I'm being overly cynical, but I don't think I am with the fact that the NFL has been recently sued for unfair hiring practices. And so their reaction to that litigation, you know, nothing, nothing makes a, a billion dollar or a set of billion dollar corporations sweat more than litigation. Right, the lawyer feeds are tremendous, right? Is you know what slowed them down, and we're going to talk about one of the coaches that is part of that lawsuit. But like that led to the NFL going like, "Hey, we need to make changes, or else more of these lawsuits are imminent." And so, I would recommend for all of you guys to go back and listen to Sunday night's episode, Monday's episode on your audio feeds, Sunday night on on YouTube, where we talked about Mike McDonald, and. In that episode, I, I explained how sort of this timeline works. But as I said then, it's more than likely that the Falcons will probably not hire a coach until sometime in February, right? Rather than something that's going to happen in the next few days. So keep that in mind. You know, maybe put your phones down for a second. Stop basing your opinions off of the most recent tweet that you've seen. You know, just like you wouldn't base your opinion on you know whether or not the sun is going to rise tomorrow based off of the fact that you know it just recently set right oh the, the end is nigh we're in for a thousand years of darkness because the sun's i just saw the sunset and it's like relax it's going to rise again in 20 12 hours right but you know that's not how a lot of people react to this stuff so now that you've hopefully calmed down a little bit let's talk about one of these potential hires that the falcons might make in february beginning with Panthers defensive coordinator Ajiro Evero, talk about why he can build off of Ryan Nielsen's defensive turnaround, but why we still have questions about what an offense under head coach Ajiro Evero might look like, and we'll get into that as we continue today's Locked on Falcons. Now, this next segment is brought to us by our sponsor, BetterHelp. BetterHelp. 
And sometimes we all need the opportunity to get something off our chest, big or small, certain things can really start to get to you. It's important to let that out, especially to someone who's unbiased on your life. Now, maybe you're excited, maybe you're sad about the Falcons' prospective coaching hire. We all have something that we need to share. And by the end of today's episode, I might be sharing far too much about my preferences when it comes to the ladies, right? But whatever you need to share, right? Therapy can be different for everyone. Most of us have bigger problems than what our favorite sports team is doing or, you know, what type of women we're attracted to. And it's important to get those things off your chest every once in a while. If you're thinking about starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online designed to be flexible and suited to your schedule. All you got to do is visit betterhelp.com slash locked on and you'll get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P.com slash locked on. So before we continue today's Locked On Falcons, I want to plug the Locked On Sports Today 24-7 YouTube streaming channel, the first of its kind. Get all the latest updates on the biggest stories across multitude of sports. And if you're looking for more local flavor, check out Locked On Sports Atlanta's 24-7 streaming channel here on YouTube. So the Falcons interviewed current Panthers defensive coordinator this past Sunday in Ajiro Evero. Now, Evero's background is interesting. He was born in England, but he grew up in California. Uh, he did play college football at UC Davis and was good enough to get a camp invite for the Raiders way back in 2004. Um, and, you know, over the last 15 plus years, he's been an assistant coach in the NFL. And, you know, the main selling point of Ajiro Evero as a defensive coordinator um, and also would be the similar selling point for him as a head coach is he has basically had an opportunity to, to coach under a lot of very accomplished defensive coordinators over those last 15 years and his ability to sort of synthesize all of those coaches sort of schemes into a coherent and sort of combining them into one, you know, great scheme is sort of what you're getting with a Jiro ever. Now, those coaches include Monte Kiffin, the longtime Bucks defensive coordinator and Tony Dungy, uh, Tony Dungy when Evero was an assistant in Tampa Bay starting back in 2007. Then in 2011, he went to San Francisco where Vic Fangio was the defensive coordinator, right? In 2016, he moved to Green Bay under Dom Capers. 2017, he was with the Rams under Wade Phillips, continued with the Rams under Brandon Staley in 2020, Raheem Morris in 2021. And ultimately, he got his first job as a defensive coordinator last year in 2022 with the Denver Broncos and then continued that this past year in 2023. For those of you that do not recall, Evero was on the Falcons' radar as a defensive coordinator to replace Dean Pease last year, the Broncos blocked it, right? And then later, when they hired Sean Payton, we're like, oh, we're good on the zero ever. We're going to bring back, you know, I think Vance, whatever. Um, I'm sorry, Vance, whatever. Vance, all I can think of is Vance Walker. Whatever that coach's name is, the former Broncos head coach. <laughs> I'm blanking on his name. It'll come back to me at some point. But, you know, again, there's a lesson there. And then Evero went to Carolina when Frank Reich was hired uh, as the Panthers DC. So again, there's a lesson there when it comes to the Ryan Nielsen stuff, but you know, that's a lesson that very few people look at. Cause again, Ian Rappaport didn't tweet, but you know, what Evero brings to the table is really that sort of Fangio Staley style of defense. That, that seems to be the biggest influence. That's the du jour in vogue defense in today's NFL. A lot of split safeties. That style of defense is basically built along the premises. We are going to sell out in order to limit explosive plays in today's NFL. But that does leave us a little vulnerable to the run, right? And that has basically been how his defenses the last two years have worked, right? Carolina was third in the NFL, third fewest in allowing 20 plus yard plays this past year. Denver was ninth fewest the year before. That's led to very good pass defenses. Carolina was 17th in both DVOA and EPA per play against the pass. This past year, Denver was 10th in DVOA the previous year and 5th in EPA uh, against the pass. But both teams struggled to stop the run. Carolina was dead last in DVOA and EPA versus the run this past year. Denver was 21st in both of those categories. And that style of defense, when it was working under Remorse and Staley and Wade Phillips, worked in Los Angeles because the Rams had a very potent offense, right? But when you don't have that potent offense, that style of defense isn't great for complementary football, right? Now, this past year in Carolina, Carolina's defense was a little weird, right? Because they were a break but don't bend defense because they were fifth in yards allowed, top five in yards allowed, right? But bottom five in points allowed. Usually it's the reverse, right? 
you give up a lot of yards, but you don't give up a lot of points. Yeah, we talked about this with Julian Council in the last crossover we did with him, the Locked On Panthers host, and he explained some of that is owed to the Panthers turning the ball over, uh, you know, in their defense giving up points on the, those short fields. Some of that was due to the Panthers not in a bit own inability to create turnovers. They were dead last in the league this past year in takeaways. Other factors were their red zone defense wasn't very good this past year. They were 27th in red zone efficiency on defense this past year. And basically that makes sense because, you know, when a team can get inside the 20 and you can't stop the run, you know, teams are going to pound it down your throat. It's why Carolina gave up a league leading number of rushing touchdowns this past year. Now, Denver's defense wasn't the same, right? They were one of the best defenses in the NFL, regardless of what category you looked at. Now, I wouldn't necessarily give Evero credit for building that unit from scratch, right? He was building off of what Fangio did, you know, when he was the head coach of the Broncos three years prior. But that is attractive if you're the Falcons and you're wondering, okay, if Ryan Nielsen's going to leave to go to Jacksonville or somewhere else, who's going to take over? Can that person build off of what Ryan Nielsen can do? And I think Evero is certainly a guy that can do that. Now, the challenge with the Giro Evero is going to be, you know, what does his offense look like? Who's he going to hire as his offensive coordinator, right? We talked about this a little bit with Raheem Morris, and one of the things that you like about Raheem Morris, despite having that defensive background, is that he spent basically the last decade coaching with Kyle Shanahan and Sean McVay, right? And so, therefore, theoretically, theoretically, he should have a pretty good eye for play calling, right, including, you know, a season where he was coaching offense under Kyle Shanahan here in Atlanta. Now, obviously, Evero spent five years with Sean McVay in Los Angeles, but, you know, given less of a background than, say, Raheem Morris comparatively, you know, that is an open question about, you know, is he just going to basically port over a McVay type of offense for the team that he winds up being a head coach for at some point in the future? You know, certainly I don't know if you want to use the Frank Reich and Nathaniel Hackett influences, uh, you know, that he's recently been around. So hopefully he'll go for more a McVay style of offense. But, you know, for you know, Evero and like so many defensive coaches, that hire that he makes, who he picks uh, at that offensive coordinator could potentially make or break him, right? Because his style of defense, as we discussed already, really works with a potent dynamic offense, right? You know, if you're consistently scoring 30 burgers, hey, you're, you're willing to concede the run because like, go ahead, run the ball against us. See if you can keep pace with, you know, our offense that's dropping 30 burgers every single week by running the football. Good luck with that, right? But if you don't have that offense, that style of defense can lead to you, uh, you know, basically being ground into the dust, as we've seen uh, for both the Broncos and Panthers, right? You need that complementary football. So, you know, I think overall, Evero has done a great job applying the lessons of those mentors like Vic Fangio, like Brandon Staley to produce capable defenses, but it needs to be matched with the right offense. And that's going to be the big challenge should someone like Evero get the job here in Atlanta. But we're going to talk about uh, another candidate in Steve Wilkes. And I think we have a bit of a better idea on what his offensive style would be because we just saw it in action in Carolina. And you couple that with him um, being you know, a very good defensive coordinator, you know, Wilkes isn't the sexiest choice, but, you know, he makes a lot of sense. And we'll break that down as we wrap up today's Locked on Falcons. Now, at the start of every new year, every small business owner is asking themselves the same question. What's the one move I can make that's going to take my business to the next level in 2024? So many NFL teams are asking the same question. And LinkedIn Jobs is helping at least the small business owners if the NFL is not helping these teams, you know, then they know that they're going to help these business owners know that success all depends on the team that you surround yourself with. That's why LinkedIn Jobs has created the tools to help you find the right professionals for your team faster and for free. LinkedIn isn't just any old job board. It's a vast network of more than a billion, a billion with a B, guys, professionals, which make it the best place to hire. Hiring is easy when you have that many quality candidates. So easy, in fact, that 86% of small businesses get a qualified candidate within 24 hours. It's why small businesses rate LinkedIn Jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus their leading competitors. LinkedIn Jobs is going to help you find the qualified candidates that you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at LinkedIn.com slash LockedOnNFL. That's LinkedIn.com slash LockedOnNFL to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. And guys, I want to tell you about Game Time, the fast and easy way to buy tickets for all the sports 
comedy, music, and theater near you. They have killer last-minute deals. That means you can buy tickets in seconds right up to the start of the event. All in prices mean you can you can get a great deal without any hidden fees. See the view from your seat before you buy so you know exactly what to expect when you arrive. And don't forget game time's guarantee, which means you'll always get the best price. If you find tickets in the same section in a row for less, they'll credit you 110% the difference. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with game time. Download the game time app, create an account and use code locked on NFL for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply again, create an account and redeem code locked on NFL for $20 off. Download game time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. So wrapping up today's Locked on Falcons, talking about another coaching candidate in Steve Wilkes, the current 49ers defensive coordinator. Wilkes did interview over the weekend on Saturday. Now, Wilkes, up until last year, was probably best known as the sort of one-and-done coach for the Arizona Cardinals in 2018. That was the year they drafted Josh Rosen. They had a disastrous you know, 3-13 and 13 season. He got fired. They brought in Cliff Kingsbury. They draft Kyler Murray, and basically they shipped him completely out. That led to some of the accusations that, uh, he has leveled of uh, unfair treatment and unfair hiring practices, right? He is participating in the lawsuit that Brian Flores uh, famously or infamously, depending on what side you're on, has brought against the NFL in recent years. Um, and, you know, I think up until that, like he was probably going to be kind of a footnote as one of these sort of, you know, relatively rare one and done head coaches. And People were probably just going to say, well, yeah, he's a good defensive coach, but he's not head coaching material. But then Matt Rule was fired in uh, Carolina last year, and Steve Wilkes was there. He was named the interim head coach, and Carolina finished 6-6 six and six under Steve Wilkes' watch. And there was a real push in Carolina, and a lot of people that watched that team over those final three months and thought, hey, this guy is very deserving of that permanent gig. Of course, Carolina went in a different direction with Frank Wright instead. That proved to be another disaster. And Wilkes went to San Francisco this past year uh, as their defensive coordinator and was able to maintain that sort of continuity of the 49ers having a top 10 defense that was started by Robert Sala years ago, D'Amico Ryans, year, uh, you know, to continue that. Uh, even though Steve Wilkes' defensive style from what he had done in Arizona and Carolina wasn't exactly the same of how those guys typically coach their defense. And as you may recall, Wilkes was on the Falcons radar. I don't think they formally interviewed him. Um, for the job, I can't recall, but we'll, you know, we'll circle back to Wilkes's time, uh, in Carolina and what we learned about him then, but let's talk about what that defensive style that he brings to the table. Basically it's an aggressive, uh, style of defense. It loves the fire zone blitz. And basically a fire zone blitz is when you bring those, you know, extra defenders, those five and, uh, or six man pressures and you play zone behind it. Typically in the NFL, when you blitz like that, you're going to play man behind it, but the fire zone blitz is like, we're going to play zone uh, and that's going to work for us. Now, the Falcons, if you've been a Falcon fan and been paying attention the last couple of years, you've seen a similar style of defense because Raheem Morris kind of dabbled in this in 2020 when he became the interim head coach uh, back then. And the Falcons, during that stretch of games, those final uh, 11 games that the Falcons played, you know, they would like to bring a lot of five and six man pressures, um, you know, to kind of, replace to complement to supplement whatever words you want to use the fact that they couldn't get reliable pressure with four rushers right um and that led to the falcons having one of the better defenses that they've had arguably the best defense they've had in over a decade until this past year with ryan nielsen now when wilkes got to san francisco you know that's not how the 49ers typically play they're they're going to rush four right we'll call that the nick bosa effect when you when you have those type of horses up front, like you don't need to bring extra pressure. You can just get reliable pressure with four. And so people wondered, hmm, this style doesn't really mesh with what the 49ers have historically done. Or does it mean they're going to change their style? Well, the answer was no, right? Wilkes basically dialed back the blitz and they had one of the lowest blitz rates in the NFL this, this past year. I think they were like bottom three or bottom four in that category. And that sort of shows adaptability, right? Rather than like, I'm going to coach my way and do it my way, right? Now, obviously, part of that adaptability is due to the fact that it's not his team. It's Kyle Shanahan's team. And so he has to adapt to what Kyle Shanahan wants to do as opposed to what he specifically wants to do. And we imagine, should Steve Wilkes have the reins and, and become a head coach here in Atlanta or elsewhere, he's likely to revert back to his previous aggressive style. But, you know, clearly 
he's adaptable. So that's something you want to see. Now, let's talk about the offense, as we talked about with Ajiro Evero. What style of offense will Steve Wilkes bring to the table? Well, when he took over as the head coach of Carolina and the Panthers, I think, traded Christian McCaffrey within a week of that happening, you sort of accepted, okay, like, I guess the Carolina are giving up on the run. And it was like, nope, we're not. We're actually going to lean into run. Now, if you look at from week six onward, when Wilkes took over for the rest of the season, only two teams in the NFL ran the ball at a higher rate than Carolina did over those final 12 games. And that was the Atlanta Falcons and the Chicago Bears, right? And it made sense that the Panthers would lean on their running game because their passing game was struggling at that point under Baker Mayfield and would continue to struggle with Sam Darnold and PJ Walker. And so Wilkes was like, let's just lean on our workhorse, Dante Foreman. And it worked very well. They were basically this physical, we're going to punch you in the mouth. That team had an identity and an identity that they were able to basically multiple times against the Falcons, kind of out Falcon the Falcon in terms of we're going to be tough. We're going to be physical. We're going to pound it down your throat. And we saw that Panthers team really buy into that. And that led to that team looking significantly better under the 12 games that Steve Wilkes was the head coach than the previous two and a half, three and a half years under Matt Rule. And certainly in the year since uh, under Frank Reich, right? So you had total buy-in under Steve Wilkes that you didn't get in the previous regime. And so that speaks to what type of coach head coach Steve Wilkes has the capability of being, he just hasn't gotten the opportunity. We can now look back and say, yes, you absolutely got a raw deal in the Arizona. Yes, you got a raw deal by the Carolina Panthers, right? We know you're a capable head coach. We've seen it with our eyes. And all these other coaches that the Falcons are interested in, you know, that are first-time head coaches, you're just guessing, hoping that they're going to be capable coaches. As I said, Steve Wilkes is a known commodity in that regard. So even though if I was putting together a rankings of the 12 candidates that the Falcons have either requested an interview or already have interviewed with up to this point, you know, if I was putting together that rankings, I probably personally wouldn't probably put Steve Wilkes in my top eight. And I'm sure many of you would probably not put Steve Wilkes much higher in your rankings on that. But as I often say on this podcast, rankings do not matter. And just because he may be number nine on my preferences doesn't mean he's a bad coach, right? Because I like a lot of the things that Steve Wilkes is bringing to the table, that physicality, good defensive coach, right? And we know that he can get players to buy in. The problem with Steve Wilkes is he simply lacks sex appeal, right? And going for sex appeal has basically gotten Carolina in trouble over the last year. And so basically what I'm saying, to go back to an analogy I made with Jarvis Davis last week on this podcast when comparing, you know, pursuing these coaches as wooing a girl, you know, flirting with a girl. You see a pretty girl across the 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 room at the club or at the bar or whatever the case may be. The the reality of the situation is Steve Wilkes ain't the most conventionally attractive of those girls that you may see when you're looking at those dozen girls uh through the course of a night, right? You know, some may call the type of girl that Steve Wilkes is in this analogy a BBW as they say. And so we're not going to go too deeper into that because I'll probably get an email from my bosses here at Locked On uh, telling me, Aaron, what were you talking about on the podcast? You, you know, this is a football podcast, not a dating podcast. So, you know, but what we will say is some men out there, me, others, who knows, right? They appreciate a big girl. Other men don't necessarily appreciate a big girl, right? They're not for everyone. But as they always say, Big girls need love too. So that's where we'll leave it, guys. Think of Steve Wilkes as that big girl that needs some love. Um, we'll continue the conversation on the podcast tomorrow, probably talking about Antonio Pierce, Aaron Glenn, sort of the last two of the 12 coaches that the Falcons are interested in that we have not to really discuss on this podcast. Again, if you want to get my thoughts on any of the other eight guys uh, that we've discussed previously on the podcast, go back and listen to the podcast, be an everydayer, tune in each and every day, subscribe to us on YouTube or wherever you listen to podcasts so you don't miss that, right? And probably next week, we will probably start getting into some positional reviews, right? I figure I got to start getting into those uh, at some point in time. I know there's other things going on with the Falcons, but you know we'll try to talk about some of these positions in the context of coaching changes, not just looking at them solely through them, what they did this past year, uh, as we often do. So that is going to do it for us here on today's episode. I want to give a, a special birthday shout out to one of my listeners. I don't know if she still listens to the podcast, but that's Tab Puller. Happy birthday to you, Tab. Uh, Tab is uh, notable in this podcast because I remember years ago, she told me, Aaron, I like it when you're humble. And Tab, like, what about 
this so humble host, you know, makes you think that I lack humility. So, you know, that whole thing of, you know, me being the humble host, a lot of that comes from Tab. So special shout out to her. If you're sitting here going, hey, Aaron, can I get a birthday shout out? I'm like, no, don't. You know, Probably not. You're probably not going to get one. But maybe if you become a Locked On Falcons insider, you know, you go through the 14-day free trial and you you, you, you send me your $4.99 thereafter, uh, you know, maybe, maybe, just maybe you might get his birthday shout out uh, on a future podcast if you are seeking it. And for those of you that don't necessarily looking for a, a birthday shout out by becoming an insider, we'll probably get into some film study, you know, later this week on the Lockdown Falcons Insiders. You know, I'm starting to do my senior bowl uh, catch up. That is what you may get into if you become a Lockdown Falcons insider. Hit the link in the description below at joinsubtext.com slash Lockdown Falcons, and you'll get access to that. You'll also get access to all of the All-22 reviews, the extended All-22 reviews that we did over the course of the season, getting that high-definition film analysis on this podcast. In addition to the things we talked about on the regular podcast, you get that extra uh, value. So check it out, 14-day free trial, $4.99 a month after that. So go check it out at the link in the description below. Guys, that's going to do it for us here. Uh, continue to check out Locked On Sports Atlanta, Locked On uh, Sports Today. It's all part of Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day.